All right, so let's summarize. When we started this whole thing, what we were trying to do is apply Bohr's postulates to the Rutherford model of the atom. And the Rutherford model of the atom, again, was this one where we suddenly shrunk down the size of the nucleus. We have electrons rotating in orbits around it. And so we applied a very strictly classical mechanics type idea where we just balance the forces using Newton's second law. And then where Bohr came in was where he introduced these two postulates, where the first one was where he said the angular momentum of the electron in the orbit is quantized according to nh over 2 pi. And so by doing that, we were able to calculate the radius of the allowed orbits inside this model of the atom. And that's what this r is equal to epsilon naught n squared h squared over pi times mass of the electron times the elementary charge squared. And then we wanted to find out how is it that these orbits interact with light? What does it mean for an electron to move in between these two orbits and then hence either give off or accept light in terms of um, what that would represent. And so we started with this um, statement, the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the electron. We then substituted in terms that we had calculated before, including the radius, the Bohr radius, or the, the radius of the allowed orbits. And what we ended up with was this term, this total energy is equal to negative times mass of the electron times the elementary charge raised to the power of four, divided by eight epsilon not squared times h squared, and that's multiply 1 over n squared. And again, this was a term that describes the energy of the electron within the nth orbit, where n is, again, 1, 2, 3, it's any integer number. And then finally, we applied Bohr's second postulate, which is this part here that says delta E is equal to h nu, meaning that the energy between each of these orbits has to represent the photon that's either been absorbed or the one that's emitted. And whenever photons are emitted, that's where we start seeing these very specific spectral lines. That's where we can apply or do some spectroscopy and try to identify the atom. And so a change in energy is just the final minus the initial energy. So we substituted in that energy term, that total energy term that we just calculated. We did it twice, where once is just denoted as the final and the other one is denoted as the initial. We then distributed it out many terms, so we're left with two terms where one of them is the 1 over n squared term minus the other 1 over n squared term, and then we had all the constants out front. Because this change in energy is equal to h nu, we then used c is equal to lambda nu, being the speed of light is equal to lambda nu, to then substitute in for nu, or the frequency, so we put c over lambda in for the frequency, and what we ended up with was an equation that looked very, very, very similar to the Ryberg formula. And the only difference was that in this, in this derivation that we just finished, we had a grouping of constants, the mass of the electron times the elementary charge raised to the power of 4, divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h cubed times c, and in the Rydberg formula, that was all encompassed in a constant called the Rydberg constant. And so we evaluated all of these constants together, and what we ended up with was a number that was only about 0.5% different from what Rydberg had measured. And so again, this was an amazing result because what it stated to, to Bohr, what it showed Bohr was that he had a model of an atom that finally represented what was actually there in reality. So now let's look at a concrete example using now what we know from the Bohr model of the atom. And so in this problem, we're going to calculate the frequency of a photon that is produced when an electron drops from n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 2 in the hydrogen atom. And so in the end, what we're going to ultimately do is we're going to just use the Rydberg equation again, which we've already used before. But now we're actually armed with a picture of what this represents physically. Because before it was this abstract idea where n is just energy levels, but there was nothing physical that tied it to what it meant in terms of what is happening in the atom. 
But now we actually have this understanding where we have this nucleus that's sitting in the center of our atom, and we have these distinct orbits that are around it. And so here is my atom, and I'm just going to draw three orbits around it. And I have my electron floating in the third orbit. And what we're trying to find out is what is the frequency of this photon that is emitted when my electron moves from the third orbit down to the second orbit. But again, we're just going to be using the Rydberg equation again to do this. So Rydberg constant 109677.57. Again, n1 has to be smaller than n2, 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 3 squared. And that means then that I'm going to calculate a 1 over lambda to be equal to 1.523 times 10 to the 4 inverse centimeters. That number I'm going to multiply by 100 centimeters over 1 meter so that I get 1.523 times 10 to the 6 inverse meters. And I'm doing this conversion because, again, I want to find out what is the frequency of this photon. And so I'm going to go back to c is equal to lambda nu because I know the inverse lambda, this number, and I rearrange this and I get c over lambda is equal to nu. Well, c over lambda, that's just c times this wave number, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 times 1.523 times 10 to the 6. So that means the frequency that's associated with this transition in the hydrogen atom is 4.567 times 10 to the 14 inverse centimeters. And so what we're calculating here is again the spectral lines of the light that's emitted by the hydrogen atom whenever we excite it. And then whenever that excitation decays from higher orbits to lower orbitals, then light is given off and we end up being able to measure that light through spectroscopy. And so this is what gives rise to those spectral lines in the hydrogen atom that we talked about earlier. But another interesting thing that we can actually learn from um, this physical model of the atom is we can start doing things like, well, how much energy does it cost to actually pull the electron outside of the hydrogen atom? Or in other words, what is the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom in the ground state? So again, my picture is, and this is thanks to Bohr, is I have my nucleus, and there are distinct defined quantized orbits around that nucleus, and I have my electron sitting here in the ground state, so it's in the first um, orbit. I send in light, so here is light of frequency nu, and that what we want to find out is what is then the energy of this photon and what is the minimum energy that's required to basically eject this electron from my hydrogen atom? How much does it cost to ionize my hydrogen atom? So again, I go back to the Rydberg formula, 109677.57. Well, n1 is equal to 1 since it's sitting in the first orbital. And again, because we're ejecting it, that means we're taking the electron and we're moving it infinitely far away from the nucleus. And so again, we're going to use 1 over infinity squared, meaning that we're moving it to something very far away. It's a very large orbit, so large, in fact, that it basically doesn't associate with the nucleus anymore. And so because of 1 over a very large number is equal to 0, then we can get rid of that term altogether, and we get 1 over lambda is equal to 109677.57. Um, inverse centimeters as the ionization energy. And this number, again, I'm going to convert into inverse meters, so I'll multiply it by 100 centimeters divided by 1 meter, and what I get is 109.67757 inverse meters. And so then recall when we were talking about the photoelectric effect that the energy of a photon, because again we're trying we can find out the energy that it takes to eject the electron by finding out what is the minimum energy of the photon that, that was used to eject that electron. That energy is equal to h nu, which we can again write as h c over lambda. And so I have Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength, 
or multiplied by the wave number. So I would write 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. I'm going to have 2.998 times 10 to the 8. And I'm going to multiply that by this 109.67757. And so in the end, I'm going to get 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And so again, what this energy represents is the amount of energy that's required to take an electron that's sitting inside the ground state and eject it from the hydrogen atom. And so then now we know that if we wanted to ionize the, the, the hydrogen atom, we know or we can calculate the frequency of that light that's required to eject that electron, which is also a very powerful thing.